tell you are some very old tales, you know. They happened, so they tell me on the day before long ago. The day before long ago, which year, Shari? Every year, Lamb Chop. Something happens every year? At the same time. Something happens at the same time every year? Exactly. But, figure it out, Lamb Chop. It's my birthday. Not exactly. Shari, I could be sitting here trying to figure this out till Christmas. Exactly. Exactly what? Christmas. Christmas happens every year. And every year, wonderful writers write wonderful Christmas stories. Lamb Chop, here are my favorites. You think they'll be mine? Exactly. The shoemaker and the elves. A poor shoemaker had no money to buy leather with which to make even one more pair of shoes. All he had were tiny scraps. So sadly, he went to sleep. In the morning, someone had sewn those silly scraps into fancy footwear. He sold the fine finished shoes for lots of money, bought a piece of leather, and once again went to bed. But he didn't sleep. He watched. And at midnight, two tiny naked elves entered by the window, swiftly sewed boots out of the leather, and then disappeared into the snow. Next morning, the shoemaker sold the boots, and with some of his earnings, bought warm wool. That day, he sewed tiny clothes. And at midnight, when the little men came again to help the hard-working shoemaker, they found their warm gifts under the Christmas tree. Jumping for joy, they put on their clothes and hopped off into the snow, leaving two thank-you notes and, of course, one grateful shoemaker. The mouse that didn't believe in Santa Claus. Squeak Nibble was a mouse who didn't believe in anything she hadn't seen, and she'd never seen a cat. You're just trying to scare me, she told her parents. There are no cats. Christmas Eve, Squeak Nibble's mother put her to bed early so Santa Claus could leave his presence while she was asleep. After the lights were out, Squeak Nibble thought, I don't believe there's a Santa Claus. I've never seen him. She left her bed and the safety of the family hole to turn somersaults on the living room rug. Suddenly, a large shadowy figure loomed like a monster ghost all covered in white fur. The creature purred, Don't be afraid, little mousie. It's only Santa Claus come to bring you a present of delicious cheese. Oh, said Squeak Nibble. How nice. Christmas came, Christmas went, and little Squeak Nibble was never heard from again. And when the real Santa Claus came to the mouse hole, he reminded the other mice that nothing good has ever come of not believing in Santa Claus. Christmas in Space Outer space is a lonely place to spend Christmas. Now the captain of the astronauts was passing a porthole when he saw something. He stood there trying to decide whether to call the others. Curious, one by one, they peered past the captain's shoulder and stood staring into the star-filled sky. The people in mission control in Houston called, What are you seeing out there? The astronauts were unwilling to tell. Then mission control remembered the remote TV camera outside the ship could be aimed from the ground, and then they could see the picture on their screens in mission control. Quickly, they focused in the direction toward which the astronauts were peering, and they gasped. And so did everyone else watching TV all over the world. For on all screens, there appeared a jolly little man in a tiny sleigh pulled by reindeer. He shouted, Peace on Earth! Goodwill to all men! And then the TV screens went snowy. Ho, 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 Roger Wilco and out. The Legend of the Christmas Tree Little Fur wanted very much to be a grown-up tree and become the mast on a sailing ship or at least an important telephone pole. In the forest, the sun shone, birds sang, sweet breezes whispered through his branches, but he didn't enjoy it. I'm made for better things than this, he said. Just before Christmas, Little Fur was cut down and taken to a fine house. Candles were attached to his limbs, a tinsel star placed at the very top. Presents were put at his feet. Oh, he thought, this is terrific. What a life. Children sat under the little fur and opened their presents. Trembling with excitement, he waited for something else wonderful to happen. But next morning, he was thrown into the yard. Children trampled his branches. The fur thought, if only I'd enjoyed the forest when I had it. Now it's too late. And then a man set fire to the tree, and the little fur disappeared forever. 
in a cloud of sweet-smelling smoke. Santa's daughter. Not many people know this, but Santa Claus had a daughter named Kathy Claus. One Christmas Eve, Kathy begged her father to take her with him so she could see the world. Santa refused. There's only room for toys, he said. If you come, some children won't get any. Then to cheer her up, he went ho, 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 but Kathy just went boo, hoo, hoo. When the elves weren't looking, Kathy snuck into Santa's sack and hid there. High in the air, Kathy popped out of the sack and gave Santa such a fright, he almost jumped out of the sled. Santa was angry, although he was happy to have his daughter's company on that long ride. He insisted that Kathy go into each house and explain to the children whose toys she had removed from the sack why they weren't getting any. To stop their tears, Kathy told them stories about life at the North Pole. The kids were fascinated. They said stories about Santa were the best part of Christmas. Kathy had found her role in life. From then on, Kathy went from country to country telling tales about life with Santa, including this one. Hans and his wooden shoes. Hans was poor. He wore ragged clothes, but he was glad at least to have a good pair of wooden shoes that kept his feet warm and dry. Now in Holland, Santa Claus fills shoes instead of stockings. And on this particular Christmas Eve, the students were hurrying home to place their wooden shoes by the fireplace when they passed a small child asleep in the street. The child had no shoes. The richer students called the child nasty names. But Hans looked at the child's feet and thought, This child has no shoes. Where will Santa leave his gifts? Poor as he was, Hans took off one of his own wooden shoes and gave it to the child who had none. That night, before Hans went to bed, he laid his one shoe by the fireplace. When he awakened, the entire room was filled with wonderful presents for the boy. You see, that child in the street with no shoes had been an angel, and Hans was rewarded for his kindness. As for the other students, when they awoke, the only thing in their shoes was mud. Where's the bear at Christmas? Bears don't like Christmas. Some folks say it's because caves have no chimneys for Santa Claus to slide down. Others claim it's because the bears love to eat pine cones and humans take the pine trees away. The reason may be that bears just don't know how to act at Christmas parties. For example, one Christmas long ago in the forest, all of the animals had gathered for their annual party when who should come lumbering out of the woods but the big old bear. The other animals were surprised, but they welcomed him. After all, it was Christmas. Then what did he do? He ate all the squirrels' nuts, all the bees' honey, and when he sat down, he plopped onto the birds' nests, cracking all their eggs. Naturally, the animals got angry with him, but the bear just trudged away, thinking to himself, Boy, this season's really a bore. And from that day on, not only don't bears go to Christmas parties, but they sleep through the entire winter. I didn't know that. The Glastonbury Thorn. There was once a man named Joseph who was very tired. Couldn't he go to sleep? Lamp chop every time he would close his eyes. A vision of an angel would appear saying, Go to England and establish the church there. Go to England. Go to England. After several nights of this, Joseph went to England. As a walking stick, Joseph chose a thorn staff in honor of the plant that once shielded Jesus. When Joseph arrived in England, he found the king didn't want a church, not at all. Joseph took the king to the city of Glastonbury, where he wanted to build the church. The king absolutely refused. Joseph was so frustrated, he hurled his staff of thorns into the ground. It bloomed instantly. The king, knowing a miracle when he saw one, agreed to build a church there and became its first convert. And at last, Joseph was able to get some sleep. <laughs> I guess so. The pine tree. A poor woman lived at the edge of the forest. She loved the trees. They loved her, giving her shade in summer, nuts and berries in fall, and dead wood for her winter fires. One cold Christmas Eve, the woman ran out of firewood. She went to look for some, but a snow had covered the ground and there was no loose wood to be found. She couldn't bear the thought of having to break a branch off one of her precious trees. So she sat in the snow and cried. A tree elf appeared and told her to use the pine cones for fuel. 
When the startled woman said, what pine cones? The tree next to her shook. And more pine cones than she could count fell at her feet. She hurried home, but with each step, the bag grew heavier. By the time she got to her house, she could hardly lift it. When she opened the bag, it was filled not with pine cones, but with silver coins. The woman told everyone what had happened. And ever since, throwing pine cones into a Christmas fire is supposed to make you rich. Balder and the Mistletoe Balder the Great was blessed by the ancient gods. This made his brother very jealous. The brother made an arrow out of mistletoe and tried to find somebody to throw it at Balder. But everybody he asked said no. Because they knew that the gods liked Balder. That's right, Lancha. The brother finally told a blind man that he was only throwing the arrow at a target. This blind man hurled the mistletoe arrow at Balder, and Balder was killed. Oh! Balder's mother, the goddess of love, wept over the body of her son. Her tears fell onto the mistletoe and froze there, which may be why today mistletoe has those white spots from her frozen tears. The mother begged the other gods to bring Balder back to life. And, so that mistletoe would never again be used as a weapon, she asked that anyone who passes near mistletoe be given a kiss, and in that way, filled with love. That's why we kiss under mistletoe. Mrs. Brownlow's Christmas Party Mrs. Brownlow decided to give a party for the children of all her fancy friends. She gave her son Bob the invitations to deliver personally. All Christmas Day, the Brownlows got ready for their guests, who were to arrive at five. Through the window, they saw ragged children in the street, watching as the food was laid out on the table. Were they hungry? I think so, Lapcha. Soon there was a crowd of poor kids. Five o'clock passed. Not one guest arrived. Well, said Mr. Brownlow, seeing as the well-off folks haven't accepted our invitation, don't you think we'd better invite in some of the others? The room filled with poor children from the street. They had a wonderful time. After the ice cream was served, young Bob sat down for the first time and felt a bulge in his pocket. He reached in and pulled out the invitations. He'd forgotten to deliver them. I'm glad you did, said Mrs. Brownlow. This was the best Christmas party one could ask for. Christmas on the Prairie John set out with his rifle to hunt up something for Christmas dinner. After a while, the sky grew dark, the winds blew, and he was surrounded by the worst blizzard he'd ever seen. Suddenly, he found himself staring into the hairy face of a big bull buffalo. John shot that buffalo, skinned the critter, and wrapped the skin around himself to keep warm. When the storm let up, John was surrounded by wolves looking for a meal. But when he tried to move, he discovered the fresh skin was frozen solid and held him tight. He worked one hand free and grabbed one of the wolves by the tail. The frightened wolf ran away and pulled the cowboy along with him. John bounced over the frozen prairie as though he were a fur sled. When the skin thawed out, he let the wolf go, jumped up, and found he was 20 feet from his own camp. That Christmas dinner, John ate nothing but cornbread and was darn glad to be alive. Christmases are tamer these days, aren't they? I'll say that, John. The Wrong Toy Christmas morning, Billy limped downstairs to see what Santa had brought him. There under the tree was a red bicycle. Obviously, Santa brought the wrong toy. Why was it wrong? Lamb Chop, ever since Billy hurt his leg, he could barely walk and he hardly wanted to. Riding a bike was out of the question. But it was a good-looking bike. Billy sat on the shiny black seat. Too bad Santa gave him the wrong toy, he thought. I can't pedal it. Maybe I can coast. He tried that, pushing against the sidewalk now and then just a bit, first with one foot, then with both. Days went by and Billy was tired of coasting. He put his feet on the pedal. All that pushing had strengthened him a bit. He could tell. Maybe I could pedal to the schoolyard, he thought. Maybe this wasn't the wrong toy after all. Billy grinned. By next Christmas, all I'll need is a bell. And that's what he got. If you turn us over and do it quick, you could have a visit with old St. Nick.
A visit from St. Nicholas. It was the night before Christmas, and all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse, when out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from my bed to see what was the matter. And what to my wondering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh, and eight tiny reindeer, with a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a minute it must be St. Nick. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He had a broad face and a round little belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk and laying a finger aside of his nose and giving a nod. Up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all and to all a good night. The horse who thought he was a reindeer. Near a river lived a horse named Mac who pulled a farmer's wagon back and forth over an old bridge. Mac loved Christmas. His red wagon decked with holly would be loaded with happy people. But most of all, Mac loved stories about Santa's reindeer when a load was heavy. Mac would pretend that he too could fly. One stormy Christmas Eve, the farmer's little son took sick. They loaded him in Mac's wagon and raced to town. The snow and ice piled high and suddenly the bridge collapsed. Because of the swirling snow, they couldn't see and headed for that bridge that was no longer there. Too late to stop, Max saw, and he prayed, If Santa does have reindeer, let me be one just this once. Suddenly, Mac realized he was soaring up over the icy river, and he landed on the distant bank. Mac never pretended again to be a reindeer. He just remembered the night when he was one. Behind the white brick. Don't read when there's work to be done, said Aunt Hetty. She seized the book from Jemima and threw the book into the fireplace, where it went up in smoke. Now that book was Jemima's favorite, about a girl named Flo who lived in a lovely room. Wondering if Flo had disappeared with the smoke, Jemima peered up the chimney and saw a white brick amongst the dirty ones. How could a brick stay white up there? Suddenly, Lamb Chop, Jemima floated up the chimney and stopped in front of the white brick. The brick slid open, and to her astonishment, Jemima saw Flo in her room, just as it was described in the book. Flo led Jemima to the next room, where tiny men and women were making toys for Santa Claus. The two girls played with the toys till Jemima fell asleep. When she awakened, she was sitting by the fireplace, and Aunt Hetty was saying she was sorry, and she gave Jemima a new storybook. And you know, I'll bet Jemima never lit a fire in that chimney again. The Gift of the Magi Jim and Della were poor, but had two things of which they were proud. One was Della's beautiful long hair. The other was Jim's fine pocket watch. One Christmas, Della wanted to buy Jim a gold chain for his watch, but didn't have the money. So she cut her hair, and she sold it for twenty dollars. When Jim came home on Christmas Eve, he couldn't believe his eyes. Della's hair, which he loved, was so short she looked like a boy. Don't be angry, said Della. I needed the money to buy your present. Jim hugged his wife and said, Unwrap the gift I've gotten you, and you'll see why I was surprised. Della tore open the wrappings and saw a pair of tortoiseshell combs for her long hair, which she no longer had. And then Della gave Jim his present. He looked at the gold watch chain and smiled. Della will have to put our Christmas gifts away for a while. You see, I sold my watch to get the money to buy the combs for your hair. The Hollow Tree Inn Coon, Possum, and Crow lived at the Hollow Tree Inn. Their neighbor, Mr. Dog, visited often, and he told them what went on at the human's house, where he lived. One day, Mr. Dog told them how Santa Claus had left Christmas presents in the children's stockings. Well, Coon, Crow, and Possum got excited and decided to hang their stockings so Santa could bring them presents. Now, Mr. Dog knew that Santa only went to the human's house. But he didn't say anything. Next day, Mr. Dog bought a lot of presents with his savings and then went to the human's attic and found a Santa suit to wear. Christmas Eve, Mr. Dog sneaked into the inn and filled the stockings hanging there. Then Mr. Dog sat down at the rocking chair for a minute to rest and admire his handiwork. 
Next morning, Crow, Coon, and Possum were thrilled to find that Santa Claus not only paid them a visit and stuffed their stockings, but Santa was still there, asleep in the chair. How Santa Claus Came to Simpson's Bar One Christmas Eve a hundred years ago in a tiny mining town called Simpson's Bar, the miners met a sick little boy named Johnny who'd never heard of Santa Claus. A miner named Dick Bullens felt sorry for Johnny, and although the night was freezing, Dick mounted his mare and headed for Tuttleville to buy some toys. They crossed Rattlesnake Creek and reached Tuttleville at two in the morning. Dick banged on the door of the store and got the owner out of bed. It was three before he was back on his horse with a bag full of toys. Just before the creek, a robber tried to shoot Dick off his horse, but the mare reared up and knocked the man to the ground. With a bullet in his arm, Dick galloped the rest of the way to Johnny's house and threw open the door. Put these toys in the boy's stocking, Dick said to Johnny's father, and tell him Santa Claus has come. Then Dick Bullens fainted. The family nursed Dick back to health, and everyone knew Santa Claus really had come to Simpson's bar. Capturing the Wild Turkey Philip and his mother couldn't afford to buy a turkey for Christmas dinner, but Philip had a book with a color picture of the wild turkey of North America. He decided to catch such a turkey for dinner. So Philip banged a wooden box with hammer and nails until the nice painter, who lived next door, said, What's all that noise about, Philip? Philip explained he was going to catch the wild turkey of North America right there in the alley. He even showed the painter the picture. The painter wished him luck. Next morning, Philip and his mother went outside to check his trap, and there, flapping in the box, was a huge turkey. <gasps> Look at the colors, mother, exclaimed Philip. This must be the wild turkey of North America. And sure enough, the turkey had gold feet, a green wing, a pink one, a yellow tail, and two red legs neatly tied together. Philip's mother smiled at the neighbor's house, and she never did ask why that turkey smelled so strongly of paint. The Christmas Rose Wilhelm walked in the woods to find a Christmas tree for his sister. I don't have any money for presents, he said, but a tree would brighten up the cabin. In the snow, he found a rabbit caught in a trap and he freed it. Thank you and happy Christmas, said the rabbit hopping away. In the deepest part of the forest, where no one had ever been before, Wilhelm found a wonderful green bush with a single red rose on top. Wilhelm took the rose and ran home. No sooner had he gotten inside than the king knocked on the door. Congratulations, Wilhelm, he said. You found the magic Christmas rose that no one has ever seen before. Give me a small piece to plant in my garden, and I'll give you a sack of gold. With the king's gold, those children had the best Christmas ever. So if you find a rose in the snow deep in the wood, pick it. Who knows? It might be the Christmas rose. La Bifana Late one night, somebody banged on the door of La Bifana's cottage. She opened the door a crack, and there was a tall, bearded man. Two more behind him were seated on camels. Now, camels were very rare in Italy in those days. Actually, they still are. And that old woman was scared. What do you want? She asked. Madam, said the tall man, we are three kings following a star to Bethlehem, but we've lost our way. Why do you want to go there? Asked La Bifana. We are bringing gifts for the newborn baby Jesus, the Son of God. Said the man. Well, responded La Bufana, you'll have to ask someone else. She slammed the door, and the visitors rode away. But the woman couldn't forget what they said. Next morning, she loaded her donkey with presents and went to look for the Son of God. Every year since then, La Bufana has gone from house to house in Italy, leaving gifts for the good children who live there, in the hopes that one of them just might be the baby Jesus. A boy's visit to Santa. At the door of the great house covered with ice and snow, Danny saw a boy just like himself. Does Santa Claus live here? asked Danny. The other boy nodded. I'm his son, Bear. The two boys walked past dozens of doors to a particular one and went in. There were Santa and Mrs. Claus. Hello, Danny, said Santa Claus. How's your sister, Kate? After a little chat, Danny went with Bear to look at other rooms in the big house. They saw the toy shop, the candy kitchen, the game factory, the doll works. They went into every room except the one at the top of the stairs. Nobody's loud in that room, said Bear. 
That night, Danny couldn't sleep, wondering what could be in that room. He climbed the stairs and opened the door, but the room was dark. He stepped in, and suddenly he was falling through the air, down, down, into his own bed. It was Christmas morning. His father was calling him to come open his presents. Danny had been to see Santa Claus, and now Santa Claus had been to see him. Is there a Santa Claus? A long time ago, a little girl named Virginia O'Hanlon wrote a letter to a newspaper. She said some of her friends had told her there wasn't any Santa Claus, and she wanted to know if they were right or not. The editor wrote, Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. He exists as certainly as love and generosity exist, and you know they give your life its highest beauty and joy. Your little friends are wrong, Virginia. How sad the world would be if there were no Santa Claus. It would be as sad as if there were no Virginias. Not believe in Santa Claus? You might as well not believe in fairies. Nobody sees Santa Claus. But that is no sign that there's no Santa Claus. The most real things in the world are those that neither children nor men can see. No Santa Claus. <laughs> Thank God he lives, Virginia. And 10,000 years from now, he will still live and make glad the hearts of childhood. The Festival of the Lights. It was wartime, and this winter food was scarce. Many Dutch Jews had been hunted down and killed by Nazi soldiers. That's what happened to Isaac's parents, but an old Christian couple had hidden him in their attic. Now, this couple loved Christmas and had saved bits of candles and cans of food so they could celebrate with a small tree and a big meal. They told Isaac about Christmas. He told them about Hanukkah, the Jewish celebration near Christmas time when Jews light candles for the eight days of the holiday. The more Isaac remembered, the sadder he became, and the couple suffered with him. Let's do what we can, they agreed. And on the first day of Hanukkah, to Isaac's delight, there were two candles shining brightly in his attic. For each day thereafter, the couple lit another candle and opened another can that they'd been saving for their own holiday. There would be no sign of Christmas for them this year, but their gift was the joy they saw reflected from the Hanukkah candles in Isaac's eyes. The Night It Rained Toys in the year 1910, Santa Claus caught a cold. A bad one? A whopper. His nose got so red, the elves started calling him Rudolph. Was he too sick to go out? Santa wanted to go, of course. Without him, who would deliver the toys? But Mrs. Claus was firm. Santa would stay in bed. She said, I'll drive the sled. Santa started ho-ho-hoing. Nobody can drive that sled but me, he said. And then he sneezed more. It was decided Mrs. Claus would deliver the toys. How'd she do? The sled was doing well until Mrs. Claus saw a great light in the sky swirling right at her. It was Haley's Comet. She swerved the sled suddenly to avoid being hit, and the sled tipped on its side, and all the toys in the sack fell out and poured on the village below. And in that little town, they remember Christmas Eve 1910 as the night it rained toys. My goodness.